introduce to you Ralph Cicerone, president of the National Academy of Sciences. He's, his interests are in atmospheric chemistry and radiative forcing of climate. Dr. Cicerone. You've all heard these phrases that the support for science is a mile wide but an inch deep and sometimes when there's a crisis you can really see how shallow it is. So we also know that the health of what we do and the value of it and the way we are governed depends somehow on the public trust and attitudes towards science. There are a few data, for example, the wonderful set of data at the National Science Foundation, National Science Board, on attitudes towards some specific technologies. The Climate Gate emails were a teachable moment about human frailty being a part of the practice of science. The message that the public got out of those email exchanges was very damaging. For example, the chatting that they did about how to handle peer review of some of the people who didn't agree with them sounded very much to the public like this is suppression of free speech. The public doesn't know what peer review is, but when they hear that we're trying to suppress the publications of other people, it sounds like suppression of free speech. And in the United States, free speech trumps everything. Uh, secondly, the, some of those chatty emails made it sound as if uh, influence is what controlled not only what gets published, but what we all end up concluding. And we know that's not true, but the lack of openness and uh, uh, the difficulty of obtaining some of the data that were in question just fed into these suspicions and got us in trouble. So in my position at the National Academy of Science, as I'm fortunate to receive a lot of uh, contacts from high-level people, and beginning about last January, February, March, April, I heard from a large number of people who I know all of you respect, in uh, certainly Republicans in the House and Senate, business leaders, current Democratic politicians and leaders, and they all said that their reading of the damage that had been done by the email exchanges and IPCC was quite serious and that there was, no, there was going to be no public agreement whatsoever in Congress about any actions to deal with climate change, even the most modest ones that I think most people would think would be win-win situations. One of them that I'll spend a few minutes on is to redouble our efforts to make research data more available. Some of the most severe disputes and attacks on climate research of the past few years have arisen over access to data. So sensing that we really do have to focus on uh, being just more clearly transparent in everything we do and making as much available to everyone who wants it as possible, the data that underlie a publication should be publicly accessible. But the committee went on and pointed out the data, the word, is taking on more and more meanings today. Just looking around the room, knowing a lot of you and the specialties you work in, the types of data you work with are very different from each other. Every individual field is different. And when you look at climate science, how many individual subfields are there? In some subfields, we have standards that are being created and enforced, say, in satellite missions. In other subfields, we have no standards whatsoever. So I think that we really have to get together to uh, agree upon some standards that we will all uh, support. Instead of trying to solve this problem for all of science, why don't you focus on climate? Because that's where the problems are. And it's true, and yet the touchiest fields of science are those that impact the, the public in general, certainly climate data. But any field where there's an immediate public impact, social or commercial, is going to have the same problems that climate is having now. So we do have a large task in front of us on behalf of all of science. And also funding agencies are being forced to start requiring more access to data. So if these kind of heavy-handed approaches become just that, heavy-handed, uh, we're not going to like it. So I think the more we can do on our own, the better. So we have a lot of opportunities. So my, my bottom line pitch to individual scientists is to just be as open as you can about your data. And 
also you have to tell people why you can't give them everything all the time. So I think we should try to be much more open and it's actually going to be easy uh, because it's the right thing to do in the first place. So I think we should try to be much more open and it's actually going to be easy uh, because it's the right thing to do in the first place. Uh, so we should look for the, the right things to do and not try to get into artificial operations that will not advance science, but instead focus on the things to do that will help the science to advance in the first place. Are we trying to appeal to public opinion so that we can be loved and feel good? Is it to get more privileges somehow? Uh, is it so we can be paid more? I don't think so. I think the reason is that we should value a positive public opinion of scientists for this much deeper reason that uh, some kind of trust underlies our entire enterprise and the public support for it, let alone whether the information that's generated is going to be used or not. So I will stop there and encourage any objections or questions for you. Over the past hundred years, you can think about most of the most severe backlashes that have happened against the science and technology fields have occurred when the pace of change has, you know, in science and technology greatly outpaces the, the legal framework, the ethical framework, the social framework to support it. The pace of change, I think, really is frightening people. Uh, and there's so many prominent examples of it. And some of the things that are coming down the road about synthetic biology, for example, uh, the few people in the public who stop to think about it are, are really afraid. So it's very much incumbent on the research community to watch over what they're doing and to interact with the public at each step so that it doesn't seem like a complete shock and uh, completely unprovided for when something new happens. When we talk about the public, it's not a single public, uh, especially in a country like ours that's so heterogeneous democracy where people are all over the lot. So I think you have to set your expectations on what kinds of people you're willing to deal with. And most of us just do not want to drop what we're doing and go off and argue with anybody who comes forward. So that's why I emphasize that the things that we should be doing to address our own enterprise should be the things that we should be doing anyhow. The ones that should be advancing science rather than so that we can choose our battles. Uh, the other thing I grabbed is I brought summaries with me of the public opinion polling about how much damage has been done and the public attitudes, let's say, about climate change. And some of the results are pretty uh, os oscillatory, but some of the more dependable trends are that more people now believe that scientists disagree. Uh, there's been a large increase in the fraction of people in the public who think that scientists disagree over these facts, that more people believe that climate change that we're seeing now is completely natural. So those are the two big trends that I'm aware of. And also a point regarding scientists disagreeing and that bringing you to the topic of uh, climate engineering, a subject in which scientists do disagree about what the community ought to be doing and, and advocating. And I wondered if you just want to take the opportunity to comment a little bit on that topic and how we can treat it with integrity as a community. I've spent a lot of time on that topic over the years, so I'm going to force myself to be brief. The, my bottom line is that we should be doing research on climate engineering because we have to get these discussions out of the back rooms and out of the chat rooms and, and non-scientific arenas and treat it like normal science, subject to normal peer review and to self-correction so that the ideas that are truly bad and dumb and dangerous get exposed clearly and we should be done with them. I think scientists should band together and agree to a moratorium to not participate in any large-scale implementation until a bunch of conditions are met. I think we have to deal with this as a research issue and head on, but agree that we're not going to try any large-scale implementation until a number of conditions are met. International monitoring, uh, scientific oversight, uh, 
etc. Because as, as all of us know, you can be the only person in the room who has a different view and you can still be right. So once again, I think our journals play an enormously important role here. That to be a good journal editor, you don't simply count the number of reviews one way or another. Uh, you have to see what's in the substance and whether the dissenters have a, a valid point of view which can be tested scientifically rather than just rejecting someone who's out in left field one way or the other. So once again, I think these are the kinds of things which we should be doing anyhow. Well, and they will also help us to address the, the various inputs we get from the public. And finally, one point that you brought out that was very interesting about climate engineering. I, um, I know at least the AMS has a statement on this now that's posted on its website encouraging just what you said, that really in order to get into this sort of thing, we really need to know a lot more about it. We need support from our institutions. Occasionally we have to convince our government that things are worth paying for if you want to get it right. <laughs>